but one spell of its forgotten in the raven God will feed and the of Johannesburg Choir and we will just welcome you guys with some music. <coughs>
Thanks very much to the UJ Choir and for all of you for coming today. Uh, I'm now going to call upon our Vice Chancellor, Professor Chiletti Marwala, to do the formal welcome introdu and introductions. Sanwana, Dumela, uh, Professor Knight, I wanted to interpret one of the music. It says, how, I, how am I going to afford uh, the diary? Is it diary, the one that you pay to get married? Dowry. English is only my 11th language. <laughs> because uh, my father's cows are finished. Isn't it, uh, um, Franz? Exactly, you know. Uh, on behalf of the University of Johannesburg community, I would like to warmly welcome you today to the third annual Eric Mulowi Memorial Lecture. In particular, I would like to thank and welcome the family of uh, members of uh, Eric Mulowi uh, from the Muleleki family that uh, you are with us here today. I think we should give them a round of applause. <laughs> a special uh, warm welcome to Mr. Eric Mulobi's wife, Mrs. Martha Mulobi, and uh, his daughters, their daughters, Lele and T. Seto who are also accompanied by their husbands. I think we should give them a round of applause. In his obituary in The Guardian in 2006, Eric Mulobi was described as small, quietly spoken, and an unlikely revolutionary. His legacy has proven to be anything but small. We honor him today at the University of Johannesburg, in part because of his instrumental role in shaping the development of education policy for post-apartheid South Africa. He envisioned a future for education that few could dream of two decades ago. In 2007, the University of Johannesburg awarded Eric Mulowi an honorary doctorate for his contribution to community development 
education, and social responsibility in business, and he also held an honorary, an honorary professorship in the College of Business and Economics at the University of Johannesburg. His history is inextricably linked with ours. I'm reminded of an anti antidote about Eric that appeared in The Guardian. After 1994, he and his wife Martha bought a house in Observatory. It was a world away from where they came from in the township. Unlike the communality of the townships, there was a coldness as families remained sealed off by high security walls. Eric Mlobi, not one to conform, organized a party and went from door to door, inviting the entire neighborhood and slowly formed a community in observatory. It is fitting then that the University of Johannesburg community honors him particularly at a time when we are also embracing change. UJ is taking a significant step forward by embracing the fourth industrial revolution. I must confess Professor Knight has already apologized that she is not going to mention the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> so I will have to mention it also so to fill in the gap. And in this regard, we're ensuring that our graduates are armed with the necessary tools to deal with the reality that is imposed by this change that the fourth industrial revolution is bringing. It was after matric when he began working as an electronics technician and was the, and was the age of many of our students that he had his first encounter with racial discrimination that led to his polit politicization. Eric was the only black technician in a team with 18 people. And now and then, the four men, uh, Dr. Professor Walisi Sirote, you still remember the title of the four men. The four men would inform him to disappear for a day to invade being seen by a visiting inspector <coughs> who did not appreciate seeing a black person. Uh, it was only when he visited the local trade union offices, Mr. Franz Baleni, that Eric realized that it was illegal for any company <coughs> to employ uh, black people in skilled <coughs> jobs. This incident spurred him to action. At the tender age of 31, he was jailed on Robben Island for his political activities and imprisoned for six years. Eric never to waste time. He used this time to study and he obtained a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of South Africa. It is here that his narrative changed. He was released in 1980 and was later employed on the education aid program of the South African Council of Churches under the leadership of Dr. Bayas Naudi. The 80s were a pivotal time in South Africa, mainly spurred in part by the 1976 Soweto uprisings. When students took to the streets, the country was in mayhem, on the edge of a full-blown war, and international pressure had increased with trade sanctions at their peak. The 80s is often viewed as the most violent years of apartheid, as the government tried to hold on, on to its illegitimate power by any means necessary. But the fight had become more united than ever. Eric was instrumental in the formation of the United Democratic Front in 1983, and Mukuseli 
uh, you could stand up so that you could be acknowledged. He was one of the most uh, militant activists of the era. You will know this. I think we should give him uh, a round of applause <laughs> for discovering a new form of militancy. Because uh, we need to understand that times have changed. Education is the new form of militancy that we need to adopt. His role as a revolutionary in the sphere of education also evolved. He was elected to the national coordinator of the National Education Crisis Committee, an alliance of high school and university students, as well as youth and labor movements. The NECC was created as a response to the crisis in black schools. It was here that the vision for education policy after democracy was materialized. His work in education did not stop there. In 1990, Eric joined the Kakiso Charitable Trust as its chief executive. <coughs> At Kakiso, he had the responsibility to raise funds from foreign de development aid agencies and to channel this into educational and community development projects in South Africa. And at that time, the so-called South Africa had many, many nations. I have my ID. I was a citizen of a fictitious country called the Republic of Venda. Still have the ID <laughs> to prove for it. And when I had to go to England when I was in high school to understand, to attend um, the International Youth Science Fortnight, I had to go and get the South African passport at the South African Embassy in Venda. That was the contradiction of that era. I'm reminded of a story that was narrated to me by Dr. Sidney Mufamad. He says he used to walk, go around the world with his Republic of Venda passport, especially friendly countries. And the South African uh, police went to Kosatu House where he used to, uh, to work and say, we're here to collect your passport. And uh, Sydney said, who are you? They said, we're from the South African police service. It's a police force at that point. He says, no, 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 no. This is the property of the Republic of Venda. You will have to come to the Venda Supreme Court to get this document. <laughs> and he tells me that they looked at, at each other confused and walked away. Those are the times. Eric Ed Kahiso had the responsibility to raise funds in order to advance community development and education. Education is very, very important. Most of the money raised went to support black students as bursaries for black students and was also invested in rural development and housing projects. In 1994, he co-founded the Kahiso Trust Investments, the KTI, which is an investment organization that supports the effort of the trust. The KTI model of financing development activities produced by a share of the profits derived from the KTI was a unique way of financing social development. His work with KTI earned much respect in business community as more and more of his advice was sought. Consequently, he served on many company boards and held directorship in several leading South African companies. And in this regard, I really need to make this remark. That for South Africa to work, all the important factors in our society must work in coordination. So this concept of monopoly capital that is bandied around without pure understanding should not be used to scare off investment into our economy. Among many prestigious national and international awards, Eric was awarded an honorary doctorate of law by a neighboring university. I am not going to mention it. <laughs> the University of the Witwatersrand. Eric's legacy as an educationist and struggle stal stalwart 
was cemented in the way that he conducted himself as an ethical leader and always contributing to the process of dynamically shaping the future that we are still fighting for today. The values and vision of the University of Johannesburg work hand in hand with the values that Eric stood for. Our vision is to be an international university of choice, anchored in Africa, dynamically shaping the future in the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> The mission of the university stands for providing accessible excellence for the majority of the poor and working class students rooted in Africa. UJ committed itself to ensuring that our students are equipped to be dynamic and active participants as the world moves into the future that we cannot understand. We are a young university, yet we are old. We have a short history, but we also have a long history. UJ was born out of a merger of the Rand Afrikaanse Universiteit and the, the Technikon Vedvatersrand and the two campuses of Vista University. 12 years later, the institution now claims a position among the great academic institutions in South Africa and globally. The University of Johannesburg sees itself at the center of providing world-class solutions to teaching and learning and ensuring that we support the future that our so country is moving into that we are beginning to understand. This, of course, means we have to be preparing South Africa to be ready for the fourth industrial revolution. The president of South Africa has developed the presidential commission on the fourth industrial revolution. It's so important that he himself is chairing this uh, body. It is so important that he selected the, the uh, vice chancellor of the University of Johannesburg to be his deputy. <laughs> I think you can give the University of Johannesburg a round of applause. The university is firmly committed to breaking new ground on the frontiers of learning innovation with particular emphasis on the use of our online capabilities to enable real time anywhere in the world, teaching and learning. Just recently, I have to uh, congratulate uh, Professor Engineer Parekh. We have introduced a course on artificial intelligence which all our first year students are required to take. You can give engineer a round of applause. <laughs> Therefore, the University of Johannesburg is contributing to creating a generation of globally connected and fully equipped global citizens. And it has launched its first batch of 100% online programs in 2017 in partnership with academic partners. To ensure that every student has access to affordable and high quality education, UJ has raised 224 million against our target of 200 million for the year for our missing middle students. The missing middle students are these students who are not poor enough to qualify for LESFAS but they are not rich enough to actually be able to afford. And if nothing is done about them, then they become left out of educational opportunity. We are anticipating that by the end of this year, we will actually have surpassed 250 million rents. In the QS World University rankings, UJ climbed for the second time following last year's rise. It is actually quite noteworthy that in quite a number of rankings, majority of rankings were ranked better than the University of Johannesburg. 
uh, University of Pretoria. We can't be ranked against ourselves. <laughs> so we are amongst the top 1.8% universities globally. And we are retaining the fourth place nationally and moving up to the fifth place continentally. You can give us a round of applause. The, UJ also takes a special pride in the Times Higher Education University impact rankings. This is a global ranking of impact and innovation based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. <coughs> In two individual SDG rankings, UJ is ranked fifth globally for reducing inequality and 43rd globally for gender equality. In the world. In the world. <laughs> so you can clap. <laughs> so things are going very, very well at the University of Johannesburg. I want to think that this is a legacy that Eric Mulobi would have been proud of. Eric Mulobi has played an instrumental role in the post-apartheid educational and social responsibility. It is in this part, with his efforts, that have led us to where we are now. As we head into the next phase, my hope is that our institution will continue to be an embodiment of Eric Mulowi's life, premised on all that is right and just. Thank you very much, Nyabonga. So thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sarah Gravett. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Now, earlier, Jane asked me, what are you going to say about me? Don't say too much. And I, then I said, hmm, I'm going to say you have a beautiful apartment in Toronto. <coughs> you cook well. And you introduced me to wine in Canada, Canadian wine. Uh, but on a more serious note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a privilege to um, introduce Jane. She is the professor of the uh, 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 she as a professor of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, University of Toronto, and important, a distinguished visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg. She focuses her research on the international dimensions of higher education at the institutional, national, regional and international levels. Her work in over 70 countries is done with universities, government, UN agencies, and this work helps to bring a comparative development and international perspective to her research, teaching and policy work. You will see in the summary of a biography the many publications and the most recent publications. In the last three years, her interdisciplinary research has explored the role of international higher education, research and innovation in strengthening relations between and among countries, especially with regard to addressing global issues that cannot be solved by one country alone. Equally important is the study of how international relations impacts higher education, research and innovation, both positively and negatively. She is a recipient of several international awards, including the Outstanding Researcher Award from the European Association for Institutional Research and the Gilbert Medal from Universitas 21 and two honorary doctorates for her contribution to higher education. And then, by the way, Jane is also a student. She is busy now with her second PhD. So tonight you will be uh, addressed by a distinguished visiting professor who's also a PhD student. Jane, we are looking forward. Thank you, Professor Gravett, for such a warm uh, welcome and uh, introduction. What she didn't say is that 
I really am allergic to cooking. <laughs> I'm not so sure it was a delicious meal. Anyway, I am wanting to start by addressing the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg, uh, Professor Mawala. Perhaps I should be calling you Mr. Fourth Industrial Revolution. <laughs> so now I have mentioned the four IR. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Uh, senior, uh, ex the executive leadership group, the Malobi family. I think we are honored to have three generations of the Malobi family here this evening. Um, Mrs. Malobi and her daughters, and um, Eric Malobi's aunt. Also, uh, thanks to an address to Professor Gravit, who is the executive dean of the Faculty of Education. Uh, Professor Matala, uh, Senior Director of the Postgraduate School. Professor Cross, the Director of the Ali Mazur University, Ali Mazur Center for the Studies of Higher Education. Distinguished guests, colleagues, and most importantly, students. It has been 25 years since democracy has arrived in South Africa. Great strides have been made towards achieving this vision. And Eric Malobi's enormous contribution to ensuring equitable, accessible, and quality education remains a vision for us all to aspire to. I'm not sure any of you would disagree when I say we are living in a very troubled and tumultuous uh, world. We have, many, we have many global challenges facing us, including our unrest in civil protests in Lebanon, Hong Kong, Chile, Argentina. We have the proxy war continuing in Syria with human devastation that is just uncountable. Of course, the epidemics of Zika virus, still active in 89 countries of the world, the Ebola virus, as well as the global challenges that are facing us. I don't want to start on a negative note I want to talk about how we can be addressing these global challenges that are facing us. I started the question of thinking about the role of international higher education and international relations, asking how can higher education, research, and innovation contribute to strengthening relations between countries and addressing these global issues. How can universities, research centers, innovation and knowledge hubs, centers of excellence, education organizations, all higher education uh, bodies, how can we begin to look and continue to address the global challenges of climate change, <coughs> migration, epidemics, humanitarian relief, I could go on. I started looking at these questions through a higher education lens. Soon I realized that this demanded an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And that's when I realized I needed to get more knowledge and started my PhD program in international relations. As I looked at the academic literature, and as I was examining national policies, both in the higher education context and international relations, I became quite troubled and dismayed. Why? I was so surprised to see that higher education, research and innovation 
was being situated, was being framed as a tool of soft power. Now, what is soft power? Soft power has been coined, a term coined in the mid-90s by an American called Joseph Nye. And basically, it is saying we need to achieve national interests and objectives by using attraction, by using persuasion, and probably quiet, co quiet, quiet coercion. It's the carrot, not the big stick approach. Now, why was I dismayed? I was dismayed because the history, and especially the current history, of international higher education is based on partnerships, is based on regional and international networks, is based on exchange. So why is it being framed as a soft power? And if we really examine power, power is about domination, authoritarianism. Now granted, soft power is much less invasive than hard power, hard power being military force and economic sanctions. But still, I was troubled and I felt we need to look more deeply into both the higher education discipline and the international relations discipline to see how together we can look at an approach that is based on collaboration, cooperation, mutuality, reciprocity, and not one that is based primarily on dominance. And so, as a work in progress, I've been working on really trying to examine this whole challenge facing us is what is our role as higher education actors in looking at addressing the global challenge that are facing us and strengthening relations. These global challenges, they know no borders. And they can't be solved by one country alone. It takes a multilateral, a multi-sectoral, and a multidisciplinary approach. So tonight, the topic of the talk is looking at the role of higher education in international relations, knowledge, diplomacy, versus soft power. Let me say how honored I am uh, to be able to be invited to deliver this fourth Memo Eric Malobi Memorial Lecture. So like a good academic, and probably one that talks too much, I think it's better to start with my three key messages at the beginning and not at the end. And so my three key messages tonight are knowledge diplomacy addresses the contribution that international higher education, research, and innovation to strengthening relations between and among countries. The second message is that knowledge diplomacy can help to address these pressing global challenges that know no borders. And thirdly, knowledge diplomacy is very different from a soft power approach. Now, I think it's important, and we all do it, we have to look at what terms we're talking about. What do we mean? So let me start by saying knowledge in the context of tonight's discussion and in the context of international relations, knowledge is used to represent higher education, teaching and learning, the, one of our primary functions, research and knowledge production, and innovation and use and application of knowledge. I am not looking at knowledge in epistemological way. I am not looking at scientific, tacit, indigenous, explicit, all the different kinds of knowledge. I'm using knowledge to represent these three aspects. And I will, I will return to this later on in the talk. Secondly, diplomacy 
is being used in the sense of building and managing relations between and among countries. So there you have the key concepts of knowledge diplomacy. I always feel a picture is a worth a thousand words. And so in this schema, schematic representation of knowledge diplomacy, you see that I have it presented as a two-way process. So we see that international higher education research and innovation can help strengthen international relations. But it's equally important that international relations can also strengthen our work as higher education universities research centers. I'm well aware that international relations can also inhibit and jeopardize our research, our teaching and learning. But tonight we're going to concentrate on the part of what is the contribution of international higher education to international relations and the global challenges. So why? Why is this topic even important? Why are we looking at this as a issue that needs to be um, analyzed and given more importance? Number one, as I've said already, global challenges cannot be solved by a single country. Number two, I don't know if you're going to agree with this, but we are moving into a post-truth era where reliable research and verifiable evidence is really critical. I recently was at a seminar actually in Toronto where they were addressing the fact that experts and academics are having less credibility in terms of giving advice. This is probably one of the aspects of our era of populism. Thirdly, contemporary diplomacy. Contemporary diplomacy is changing drastically. We always think of diplomacy being the responsibility, the role of the government, of foreign affairs, of our diplomats. This has changed drastically. Civil society, non-government organizations, um, multinational companies are now playing an important role in diplomacy. And that includes us. That includes us as higher education actors, research centers, etc. So not only is contemporary diplomacy changing, so is the landscape of international higher education research and innovation. We have a plethora of new regional global networks for research. We have new innovation and knowledge hubs, international joint universities, etc. So we have a very dynamic diplomacy field and a very dynamic international higher education field and how are these intersecting? That's what we're looking at tonight. There's also a significant shifting of power dynamics among countries and I will come back to this, a greater emphasis and use of soft power. So why have I used the term knowledge diplomacy. Why that? Why doesn't a term such as internationalization of higher education work? Internationalization of higher education is really important, but it's often seen more as relations and cooperation between higher education actors. Knowledge diplomacy goes much further than that. It brings in industry, civil society, all levels of government. And then we can look at education diplomacy. You'll find that. But to my surprise, education diplomacy has been adopted by the primary and secondary education sectors, of which they are not doing any research or innovation. What about cultural diplomacy? 
Cultural diplomacy is very important, very active, and very broad. It can be anywhere from artists' exhibitions to sport events to architecture to, in fact, let me tell you, I read a very interesting PhD dis recently, and you know what it was? It was on panda diplomacy. They was looking at how China was using a cultural icon um, and deciding where these pandas would be placed in foreign country zoos. And so cultural diplomacy is broadening in its approach. But guess what? They only refer to education as the exchange of students, the exchange of faculty. They don't acknowledge or include research or innovation or all those other uh, aspects that I have spoken of. Then we move to science and technology. Science and technology is incredibly important, and this, of course, is increasing. But what is happening is that the technology part is having a very strong influence. And what do we do about issues such as human rights, humanitarian relief, issues that come from our social sciences and humanities? Sorry, they can't all be addressed by science and technology. The next term I found was public diplomacy. Public diplomacy is a country that is not just working with the government of another country, it is directly engaging the foreign publics of another country. And this can often be called nation branding, the use of social media, etc. And finally, soft power. These are the terms that I found in the IR literature and in the higher education literature that were trying to capture our role in strengthening international relations and addressing these global challenges. You can see that none of them really were effectively capturing um, our role. And so we came to the concept of knowledge diplomacy. Now, what are the key elements of knowledge diplomacy? I'm going to just take a minute to go through these. This, I'm sorry, could take me an hour <laughs> to really explore these, but let me go through them quickly, and you will have heard some of them already. First of all, knowledge diplomacy involves, yes, education and training, teaching and learning, research and knowledge production, and then the application of that knowledge and research in, for innovation. It doesn't just include international higher education research and innovation. This is where it departs from internationalization. It includes partnering with other sectors, civil society, local governments, foundations, industry, etc. So it's collaborating with other sectors and disciplines is important. I think that probably one of the most critical aspects of knowledge diplomacy is the kind of relationships that are built. And these relationships are built on negotiation, mutuality, reciprocity, finding a common ground, collaboration. It's being done through conflict resolution. It's being done through mediation. It's not a top-down approach. Next one is, and we've discussed this, addressing the global challenges that we're all familiar with that can never be solved by one country alone. And finally, it's recognition recognition, excuse me, of the country's individual needs and their priorities, but focusing on an exchange of expertise and resources so that there are benefits for all. Remembering that these benefits are not the same. We hear a lot about equal benefits. I think what we're talking about is a mutuality of benefits but different benefits. So now let me turn to power. 
as a juxtaposition to diplomacy. Power, hard power. Hard power is the use of military force or economic sanctions to achieve national self-interests and national objectives. But as I've said to you already, the concept of soft power has been introduced already 20 years ago, but I think it's a fad phrase. I see how it's being picked up in the most incongruous situations. Soft power is the use of attraction, persuasion, quiet coercions to achieve national self-interest. So now what is smart power? If we've looked at hard power and soft power, what is smart power? It's not the fourth industrial revolution. <laughs> smart power is the calibrated use of both hard and soft power together. So let me make a distinction, or shall I say a comparison, looking at the commonalities and the differences between a diplomatic approach and a power approach. It would be naive of us to think that countries in international relations are not wanting to have their national interests and their national objectives met. That is a given point. That is a common denominator. But how are these national interests and these global challenges addressed? In a di diplomatic approach, it's often done in more of a horizontal networking, partnership, exchange kind of approach. But in a soft power, it's often a vertical or top down. Now, you may say that I'm trying to work at extremes in distinguishing diploma diplomacy and power, and in some ways I am to try to, to accentuate the differences. The next one is a diplomacy approach is based on negotiation, reciprocity, mutuality, common ground. When we look at a soft power approach, it is around dominance, top down, and perhaps authoritarianism. When it comes to self-interest, yes, they're common to both. But in a diplomatic approach, self-interests look at mutual but different benefits. When we look at power, it's self-interests and me first. Diplomacy is looking at competition, or built on competition, where soft power, there is more of a competitive element. And finally, a diplomacy approach looks at a win-win, Well, perhaps soft power is looking at win -lose, winners and losers. Now, this is a spectrum. This is not a black and white differentiation. But what we're really looking at is core elements. So when we look at this, we have to ask the question, what is the approach that is going to help us solve these global challenges that know no borders, that can't be solved by one country alone? Let me finish by talking about some concrete examples of knowledge diplomacy. How many of you are aware of the Pan-African University? Anybody aware of the Pan-African University? One, a cup, two, three, four, five, a few. The Pan-African University is a really ambitious project, a very complex project. It was introduced by the African Union. It has been funded by the African Development Bank, some World Bank money, and also I will refer to some bilateral funding. The Pan-Africa University has been seen as, yes, one, a chance to prepare graduate students in Africa, two, 
to advance research. But three, it's seen as an opportunity to solidify national African identity and also increase or lead to African regionalization. But let me tell you a little bit more about how it works. So the African, Pan-African University has the, has the model, now I'm going to talk about the proposal of it, was to set up five regional universities in each of the geographic regions of Africa. So in, and each university has a specialized area of education, discipline, and research. These areas definitely are looking at the global, at the challenges that are being faced by national level, regional level, and international. So let me give, I can't remember them all, so I brought them in big writing. So there's one in Kenya, which is on technology and innovation. One in Nigeria that's focusing on earth sciences and uh, health. One in Cameroon on governance, humanities, and social sciences. One in Algeria on water and energy sciences. And the fifth one is on space. Can you guess where that is to be developed? South Africa. Sorry to say it's the only one of five that's not operating yet. I won't go into why that might be. So what's interesting about this model of the Pan-African University is that we see five regions of Africa with these universities, but in each region, the university has a network of 10 other universities that work with it, plus industry, civil science, society. They also have relationships with countries with other countries. So for instance, the Cameroon one is very much linked with Sweden. Nigeria is uh, linked with India and Japan. So this, this notion of a Pan-Africa University that is, number one, trying to create a stronger African identity that is trying to increase the quality and the output of our graduate students. They only do masters and PhDs, which is trying to look at research in a networked way on five areas that address global challenges. And so it's a very, I think it'll take 20 years <laughs> before it's fully functioning, but I think the vision is one that shows us that we high, international higher education does have a role in building relations between and among countries and addressing global challenges. I'm a little bit concerned about the time, so let me just give you one more example. Uh, which one should I choose? Well, I'll take the second one. <laughs> now, renke. You know what that means? That's a Japanese word. It means collaboration. This is a very interesting uh, example of knowledge diplomacy, and it's more at the bilateral level than at the multilateral level that we just looked at in the Pan-Africa University. It's 12 or 10 universities in the UK and a similar number in Japan, and they then are working very closely with industry. And they are working with industry to address A, what research has to be done, B, how training should be um, conducted, and C, how they can strengthen the relations between Japan and, uh, and the UK. What's interesting is when I say industry, you might think that they're looking at economic issues. They are. But what's interesting is the last major project they had was on the implications of the aging society. So I'm going to go back on my word and talk about one more, if I may. I'm going to talk about this notion of an international joint university. 
Have you ever heard of an international joint university? There are one in, there's one in Africa, Egypt. There is another one being developed in Tunisia, which I expect to visit in a couple of weeks. These international universities, let me tell you, are very different than what we would call an international branch campus. An international branch campus is a university, let's take uh, University of Johannesburg, that has decided that it would like to uh, cooperate with another country and will set up a satellite operation for research and training. But it is a satellite operation of the sending country. What makes difference in international joint universities is that two countries, institutions in those countries together are creating a new entity. There are 22 of them around the world at this point. We're doing a very major project on studying these international universities. And there is another one being planned for Kenya, which is interesting. One planned for a second one in Egypt. And as I said, um, Tunisia is going to be host, is hosting already a Franco-Tunisian university. So these international joint universities are example of strengthening relations between countries, but also making sure that their teaching and learning, their research, and their innovation is addressing global issues. If you're interested in any of these plus more, I, I just can refer you to this uh, report that I did this year on knowledge diplomacy in action. You can download it uh, from the British Council. Um, it's a PDF. It is a report. It's not an academic document at all. So in conclusion, <laughs> you're waiting for that. I'm going to leave you with some questions to ponder. You know, I started on this journey of understanding the role of higher education, research, and innovation in internationalization, in international relations, by asking questions. Questions that really take an interdisciplinary approach. So I'm leaving you with questions to ponder. First of all, what are the limitations? What are the challenges associated with knowledge diplomacy? Certainly have talked about some of the limitations and challenges uh, applied to soft power, but there are the same for knowledge diplomacy. Secondly, can we believe that global challenges like climate change, epidemics, food and water security, migration, humanitarian disasters, can they be solved by a top-down, authoritarian, soft power approach? I think there are some countries in the world that believe they can. We won't discuss them. <laughs> and thirdly, from a South African perspective, and I have done very little work on this topic in South Africa, I have been I have been examining your science diplomacy policies, and I've been looking at your cultural diplomacy policies to try to get a handle of where South Africa sits on this. But from a South African perspective, what do you think are the issues, the opportunities, the challenge related to a knowledge diplomacy approach? With that, I will conclude and say, this is definitely a work in progress. This is a journey of an interdisciplinary journey, which is the only way to address it, but one that has a lot of complexities. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. That was... Uh, very much in the tradition in terms of scholarliness, but also probing the right questions of our former Eric Malobi um, guest lectures, Paul Zaleza, Trevor Manuel, and Prof. Indri Lumumba um, last year. So I want to start off by saying this is a bit the, 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 the wrong way around, 
But as the evening progressed, I noticed a number of luminary, luminaries walking in, and we haven't had an opportunity to properly thank you for being here today. I want to acknowledge the presence of Panyaza Lesufi, MEC for Education, who is here regularly and slips in quite uh, quietly. I want to give a special word of welcome to Eric Molobi's aunt, Florence, who has made the journey to be here with us today. Um, Mkoseli Jack, who has come all the way from Port Elizabeth to be with us today. The esteemed uh, Wally Sirote, Sheila Sisulu, and the Sisulu family, uh, members of the Kahiso Trust, Franz Beloy, who's just walked out, and members of our executive who've made the time um, to be with us today, Anjana Parekh, um, Aziz Pahad, esteemed yeah, guest. Yeah. I know, but uh, he's, he's just coming in. Uh, Prof Berger, um, Nolita Vukusa, our senior executive director, and all others who I might have missed. I also noticed there are some Saatchi chairs here, other distinguished visiting professors, and you all, um, we we're thrilled to have you all with us today. Um, I also want to give um, a special thank you to um, Prof uh, Michael Cross, who has been together with Prof Gravit, the host of Professor Knight for the last three years. And really her contribution has been immense, both in terms of uh, work with students, postdoctoral fellows, and as well as uh, spending time, I think, with our different centers, the postgraduate school, our international office, and others. So let me get back then to my formal speech, uh, formal <laughs> notes. Um, I, I want to once again, this is a great honor that for, for those of us who are as old as I am, uh, and I think my husband Fouad is part of that group, the, old, the older generation, uh, for those who were around in the days of the NECC and the early days of education activism, really it is a great honor um, for us to have this opportunity to, to have this, in, this lecture every year for this extraordinary man who had such an outstanding vision and mission and who was way ahead of his times in terms of his understanding of, of the future South Africa. Uh, the Malobis family's uh, passion, interest, attention to detail. Leila and I spent a huge amount of time in the last couple of days trying to make sure that things were, thing, things were on track, but also that everybody that we wanted to be here was here. Um, and, and this time has been invaluable. So to Lele, uh, Martha Malobi, and Tisetso, we really thank you and your partners and husbands who are here today. To Prof Jane Knight, it's been an absolute pleasure that you've spent this time with us in the last three years. It's gone very, very quickly. Um, your challenging and provocative talk is timely and important, particularly as South Africa in many ways is dealing with different issues related to, related to South Africa and its relation to its neighbors and to the continent, where we've seen sporadic xenophobia and other sorts of ways uh, of, of what is what is happening in our society, really um, a, a, a powder keg of, of, of social unrest. And in many ways, your talk today has allowed us to frame, frame in a po more positive way things that we, um, we, we're looking at. And really, you have shifted the discourse in a very, in, in a very positive way and in a very thoughtful way. Um, I think uh, you've made a, a great contribution, and I hopefully will continue to make one. Um, as a tireless intellectual and a PhD student, and with your characteristic boldness. And we hope that uh, your, you will continue this relationship with us, uh, even as you leave as distinguished pro visiting she professor. Still two years late. She still has two years left. <laughs> well, we, we'll have to talk about that, yeah. <laughs> but what we, we look forward to an ongoing engagement. Um, the event is jointly hosted with the Faculty of Education, and we are greatly indebted to Professor Sarki Gravit, the Executive de Dean and her team, to uh, Berenice Moody, who again is a tireless worker on this event, and all the colleagues in marketing. Uh, your impeccable organization is much ap appreciated. Uh, the Eric Malobi Committee, many of them sent their apologies today. Sydney Mafumadi, Yogesh Narasingh, Suzeka Rensberg, Linda Chisholm, who's with us today, Roger Jardine, Murphy Morobi, uh, and others. We appreciate your interest and support and your presence here today, Linda. 
And finally, to our, to our, our, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Marwala, you continue to be a deep inspiration to all of us, uh, a fierce and uncompromising inter intellectual dedicated to the promotion of accessible excellence for large numbers of students who are, in, who are entering UJ for the first time. Um, you continue to provide a vision in terms of where we would like to be and also ensuring that we, we're constantly abreast with new ideas related to the, the fourth industrial revolution. I think during the tenure of your leadership, as your, as your talk outlined, we've, the institution has seen huge leaps um, and successes in terms of providing quality education for all. I think you ensure that we always give up our, of our best, and I know the one thing you, you, you really abhor is mediocrity, and you will never allow UJ to be that. We've got to be excellent at all times. Um, we, we, we want to invite you now. I want to also conclude by thanking everybody else who's, been, who's made the time to come today amidst the rain and bad weather. But you, you, we, we, we're really thrilled. Uh, well, good weather in terms of the rain. Uh, I think some of you, ha I saw some people walking in without their shoes and uh, pretty wet. But anyway, we, we, we're, we're thrilled that you, you're here today. Um, and it's really a way also through the Malobi family to bring the community of Johannesburg into UJ. And we, we, we're thrilled about that. Um, you are invited to drinks, cocktails, and food prepared by our excellent chef, chef Pfizer. In, in the lounge uh, next door, um, when we hope the socializing will continue in the dining room. We will have a register here because it was Lele's idea that there are so many people who come and we want to ensure that we, we are in touch with you every year for the lecture. So please do put your name and your contact details down on the register. So thanks very much again, and we hope this is not the end of the evening. We will continue socializing and you'll have an opportunity to talk further to Professor Jane Wright. Thanks.